having a city on an iceberg as on Galveston Island if I look to its safety in perpetuity. A train approaches the island by means of a long steel bridge across the bay which glitters like burnished metal in the wintertime sunlight. The vast number of white two-storied frame houses in the outskirts would remind one of New England if it were not that the island is level as a floor. In the commercial part of town appear the conventional business houses and the trolley cars. Far up the cross streets is the faint surf of the breeze-blown gulf. And in the other direction, the cotton steamers are arrayed with fresco upon their black sides of dusty, chuckling stevedores, handling the huge bales amid a continual and foreign conversation, the bales leaving little tufts of cotton all over their clothing. Galveston, with a population of 40,000, is the most important seaport in Texas, and nothing can retard its commercial prosperity. Blessed with a harbor equal, if not superior to any on the Gulf, with a climate mild and generally healthy, it cannot fail to attract the attention of capitalists. Galveston possesses perhaps more wealth than any other city of the United States, having a like number of population. Her palatial residences are numerous, and her commercial and public buildings are among the finest in the South. It is a fitting tribute to the 
glory of our fine state in the form of a monument to the heroes of the Texas Revolution. Situated on the only available seaport of Texas and peopled by a hearty, earnest, and enterprising population, the marvelous destiny of Galveston cannot easily be foretold. Children turned my back to the window and, plunging from my heels, smashed 
through the glass and among the storm showers. The house creaked and was carried over into the surging waters and was torn to pieces. Terrible pile of debris. 
Here was an evercade as high as a two-story house, seemingly endless towards east and west, house upon house, all broken to pieces. Furniture, sewing machines, pianos, cats and dogs. And what was underneath? Nobody knew yet. How many had gone down with their houses was yet a closed book. All sorts of suspicious looking people were crawling over heaps of rubbish and going in and out of stores. Looting had already begun. I suggested to the city authorities that, in my opinion, the only salvation of the town lay in getting it under martial law as quickly as possible. Hundreds are busy day and night clearing away debris and recovering the dead. It is awful. Every few minutes a wagon load of corpses passes by on the streets. Early on Monday morning, when going through the long row of bodies in the hall, I lifted the pall and I found beneath it with a faint smile on her lips, Mrs. Wakely. With her gray hair all matted and streaming in disordered confusion about her shoulders. Three morgues were established, but it took a very short time to convince the most hopeful that it would be impossible to place bodies in morgues for identification and that the number who had perished was so great they would have to be buried at sea. I superintended the handling of 500 bodies over the wharves on the barges whence they were taken out to sea with weights attached to them and sunk. The sea, as though it could never be satisfied with its gruesome work, washed these bodies back upon the shore the waves being the hearses that carried them in, the sobbing waves and sighing winds, God's great funeral choir sang their sad requiem around the dead. The terrible odor from thousands of putrefying bodies was almost unbearable. Soon it was decided the only thing that could be done to save the city from pestilence was to burn the bodies of both animals and people. Wherever they were found, lumber from the wreckage was piled upon them, and they were incinerated. On one occasion, by orders of the mayor, we marched to the foot of Tremont Street, taking every able-bodied man met with, and forced them at Bayonet Point to assist in this awful work. These poor fellows were only kept up on whiskey, which was given to them by the goblet full. The stench was terrible, and the work was so disgusting that almost every moment these men were forced to stand aside, their stomachs rebelling at the terrible task. The men would say, for heaven's sake, don't make me do that. You can shoot me if you want, but I will not and I cannot. Our only answer was load with ball cartridge, take aim, and fortunately we never had to go any further. The city is under military rule and the streets are patrolled by armed guards. They're expected to shoot at once anyone found pilfering. I understand four men have been shot today for robbing the dead. I have a son, Alonzo McNeil, colored, resided at Galveston, on 17th, house number 1513. I am afraid he has been lost. Please advise me if he is living or dead, and I will always appreciate your kindness. News of the disaster reached the Red Cross on the morning of the 10th of September. On the 13th, a party of four ladies, including myself, and five gentlemen left Washington for Galveston. On our arrival, a glance over the destruction, ruin, and death was sufficient to show that no exaggeration had been possible. 
It was one of those monstrosities of nature which defied exaggeration and laughed at all tame attempts of words to picture the scene it had prepared. The best of the city had gathered themselves into a committee of 20 or more and had taken charge of affairs in general, including such relief as reached them. Relief is pouring in from all quarters, and there is no lack of supplies. The world has heard our cry, and we shall not suffer. Our duty now is to perform each day's work as it develops. The hearts of visitors were stirred as they witnessed the enthusiasm with which men, women, and even children heroically grappled with the unparalleled situation. And out of chaos brought order, and in the midst of seeming destruction, rose triumphantly to a nobler purpose and unselfish devotion. Galveston will be rebuilt more beautiful, more enduring than before, as the oak sinks its roots more deeply and grows more rugged by the storms that seek its destruction, so out of this dread experience shall Galveston grow to greater strength and greater influence. Nobody will ever know how many lost their lives in Galveston on September 8, 1900. The best guess is that at least 6,000 perished. As for the total loss along the entire course of the storm, estimates exceed 8,000. Nor is it known how hard the wind blew. A velocity of 100 miles per hour was measured just before the instruments were blown off the roof of the weather bureau. The storm tide reached a level almost 16 feet above normal, and the barometric pressure at 7.30 p.m. was the lowest ever recorded in the United States to that date. In the wake of the disaster of 1900, a determined majority of the survivors stayed on Galveston Island and turned their eyes to the future. The city commissioners appointed a board of engineers to make recommendations for protecting the city against, as they put it, overflows from the sea. In January of 1902, the board proposed the construction of a solid concrete wall to stand 17 feet above sea level and extend for over three miles. Behind the wall, the board recommended the incredible raise the grade of the city. In the fall of 1902, construction of the Galveston Sea Wall began. Storm of 
14 years before. The seawall and grape raising proved their work. When the skies cleared, the storm had claimed just eight victims on the island. A far cry from the thousands who had gone before. The city stood intact, as she would again and again, in defiance of the power of the hurricane.